Welcome once again, peeps, to the Bass Kayak and Beers podcast on the Paddle and Fit Network. I uh, hope you all had a great weekend. Uh, I know I had a great weekend. Uh, if you follow me on social media on Bass Kayak and Beers uh, in Facebook or Instagram, you already know I got the uh, opportunity to participate in Lake Fork, which is probably my favorite lake here in Texas, with the Slay Nation Tournament Series. Got second place, second behind... Um, Mark Pendergraf, the Possum King. So it's a great experience. Brian Howell was there. He's right now second in the Hobie BOS uh, race for the Angler of the Year. And a lot of great local um, hammers uh, from West Texas were also taking part in that tournament. So it was a great experience for me. I'm not going to talk about it here on my intro because actually I have Mark Pendergraf coming up, um, which again won the tournament um, this week. Uh, we're going to record and it's going to come out next week. And I'm also going to be with the Dark Waters Josh Smith podcast. And we're going to be talking about that tournament and his tournament that he won recently. So go check out Dark Water podcast. I'm recording with him. Today's Tuesday. Actually, today's Monday. This show is coming out Tuesday. I'm recording with him um, Tuesday night. So sometime during this week or next week you look out for that episode again it's going to be the dark waters kayak fishing podcast with josh smith so i'm saving that information for his podcast and my in my next week's guest mark pendergraph but again it was a great opportunity to fish lake fork uh really really tough lake when it's uh non summer it's so hot east texas is when it's hot and it's muggy it is god it is not fun but it was a grind, um, and it was exciting to fish that tournament. So, anyways, we'll talk about that next week. But on this week, we got Jamie Stevenson. If you don't know her, she is an amazing angler from north of the border in Canada. And I've been meaning to get her on my podcast Um for the last few months but it kind of hasn't worked out with the schedule she has been on the battle and fin podcast um on the adventures of outdoors woman with uh, susie roloff so we're excited and paddle and fin to have her join us again um should be a great episode we're going to talk in about uh small mouth large mouth walleye and uh, she's a multi-species angler so there's going to be a lot of great information that uh maybe if you're strictly a bass fisherman you're going to enjoy a lot of the knowledge is going to be shared as far as fishing for small mouths and uh you know interesting stuff fishing for walleye we don't get walleye here in texas so it's going to be a fun episode so we're going to have a commercial break and then we're going to be joined by jamie stevenson so hang out with us and enjoy the show Welcome back to the Paddle and Fin Podcast Network. We're brought to you by Yak Gadget. For all your kayak fishing accessory needs, go to yakgadget.com. Pelican cases, coolers, and lighting. Go to pelican.com. The 153 Bait Company. For all your hard and soft bait needs, go to the 153anglers.com. Now let's get this show started. All right, Jamie, how are you today? Good, how are you? Thanks for having me on the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us in Bass Kayak and Beers and Paddle and Finn. Your second time around in Paddle and Finn, right? Yes, second time. First time with Susie. So, yeah. How was that episode? Did you like that? Enjoy talking to Susie? I love talking with her. Like talking with her is just like talking with a long time friend. I've never met her before, but she's so easy to talk to. I could talk to her for hours about fishing and just her passion for kayak fishing is amazing. Yes, yeah, she is definitely. Uh, she's. I know she's working as a tournament director here for the Paddle and Fin Trail. So hopefully in the off season we'll get a little bit of more of the Adventures and Outdoors Women podcast uh, yeah. with Zuzi Roloff. Great podcast. Um, it does a lot of uh, uh, great information uh, on kayak fishing and promoting female anglers. Uh, as we were talking about in the pre-recording, it's not. It's not always easy. Although it's kind of different up in Canada for you. Um, than it is here in the United States, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But we are, you know, you are taking part in a, you know, majority, vast majority, dominated by male um, kayak anglers. How's that experience been for you? You know, from start to be, from the start of what you kayak fishing and going into tournaments to where you are now. 
Was it intimidating for you as a female angler to get involved in the sport and compete against guys? Very intimidating at first. I So I started kayak fishing in 2018. And as soon as I got my kayak, I fell in love with it. Um, I did a little bit of research online and Googling kayak fishing tournaments. And to my surprise, there was a series in Ontario called the Ontario Kayak Bass Trail, which is growing like crazy. But in 2018, they were kind of just getting started out. And I started kayak fishing in the spring and decided to sign up for my first tournament in September. And prior to that, I had never specifically targeted bass in my life. I was more of a pan fisher woman where I'm going out for perch and walleye and things just to eat for dinner. So 2018 was my first year targeting bass. I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about bass tournaments. So I just spent that time between June and September learning how to fish for bass. So it was a whole new experience for me. Um, my first tournament, I two days before I wanted to drop out of it, but I have to tell you, I'm so thankful that I went through with that tournament. Um, you know, people were really friendly to me when I showed up asking if I needed help. And there's a few people who were like, are you here by yourself? And I'm like, yeah, here by myself. And I had a great time on the water. It was one of the best things I've ever jumped into. Um, not worrying about what anyone thought, just going out there fishing and having a good time. Awesome. How, what part of Canada are you fishing from? Ontario, right? So Ontario, I live in southwestern Ontario. And actually, like from my window, I can see Michigan. So nice. <laughs> yeah, so I'm really close um, near Port Huron, and not very far from Detroit either. So we're very south. That's crazy how Detroit is so close to Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how's how's the season over there for fishing? Like, what's what's the the tip on a typical year? What's the window for kayak fishing as far as you know weather permitting? So when it comes to bass, so where I live in Ontario, we have a season for bass. So where I live, you can't fish for bass until June, the second last weekend in June. Really? To the end of November. Yeah, so we have a conservation rules where you can only fish during those months. So the bass is closed after that. And for myself, I start walleye fishing in March, uh, weather depending as long as the ice has moved out and wearing a dry suit of course for safety and I, i'll start so i'll start walleye fishing in march and i'll do walleye i'll do pike and then i ha we have to wait for bass to open the last second last weekend in june and that's all the way to where you said uh to the when? end of november oh the end of november yeah wow so yeah kind of like what five months yeah five yeah. and a half months no i have to tell you sometimes it seems like forever <laughs> now when you say when you say you can't fish for bass now you can't target it right like yeah. what's what's the difference because i've seen that before in other videos where it's like is it that you can't keep them or that you can't target them you can't target them so you even have to be careful sometimes of what lures you have tied on if you're fishing for pike you could get accused of fishing for bass because sometimes you will be targeting pike in the spring and you'll accidentally catch a bass so you're supposed to release them right away you can't take a photo you have to release them not hold them up just put them right back in the water oh wow that's yeah. interesting mm -hmm. i mean that's a great i mean that's i think especially because you live in northern part of the of well not northern part of the country northern part of the continents i should say mm -hmm. um it is you know bass there are more specific specifically largemouth bass is more fragile ecosystem for them it's not like texas you know where they grow big because they mm -hmm. can feed year round year over round. there it's it's different and i have to say even though that concept is kind of alien to us here in texas it has worked, I think, great for you guys. I was just looking at your standings for that monthly tournament. We were talking about it. You're in the upper 90s, and the leader in that tournament for the monthly tournaments, it's at 102 inches, which I've never thought you can achieve that, you know, yeah. on on a tournament up north, uh, north of the border. That was pretty amazing. Yeah, and the guy who was in first place, he's catching largemouth, whereas I'm catching smallmouth, and... Normally up here, smallmouth are known as the, if you're fishing a tournament, you're going to go after smallmouth. But that 
the guys who are further up east than me, they're starting to change that idea. They're they're catching these big largemouth and they're putting up big numbers, especially later on in the summer. What's the what's the what you consider a trophy bass in in your part? It's where you live. So I would say for a smallmouth, um, I just caught my personal best smallmouth. It was 20 and a half inches, but you can catch them 21, 22 inches. And I would say that is top ends. Like they can get pretty big, uh, pretty fat. And for large mouths, I'm thinking it'd be 20 and a half inches would be, would be, I saw yeah. someone this month caught 21 and a half inch large mouth, but that would be tipping the scales. Yeah, that that's what we like consider like a trophy bass. Yeah, that's interesting. That's not bad numbers. Yeah, yeah, that's at all. Really good. Yeah, yeah. So, what have you enjoyed most doing, walleye fishing or bass fishing? That's a tough one because it's so different. But I, so many people are gonna disagree with me, but I love that early spring run of walleye. People, people don't think it's a thrill to catch walleye because they're not jumping out of the water, but for me, it's it's not just the fight that's so interesting to me when I'm fishing. It is learning how to target a species and becoming good at that. Um, every species you're going to target, there's something to it that you're going to have to learn in order to be successful. So for me, targeting walleye, learning how they, you know, the patterns of how they mark, migrate, where they are in the spring, suspending, suspended. I love that kind of thing. Whereas some people kind of turn their nose at it. So I would say walleye is one of my favorite species. And then after that, I would have said largemouth, but that probably was because I was better at it than smallmouth fishing. But now I'm starting to get really good at smallmouth fishing. So that's probably my second favorite species to target. Nice. And there's, there is a difference, you know, when you think about smallmouth and largemouth, other than the obvious, the name. But it, I, I feel like smallmouth bass are just have a nastier attitude and they're built like they're i think tanks. the biggest yeah they're tanks and i think like i've talked to other people about this um in my this is my theory now i've caught i haven't caught a lot of small mouth bass here in texas because there's not that many of them they don't grow that big um same same reason why large mouth bass maybe don't grow that big in your area is because the weather you know over here the the weather is not conducive to smallmouth bass mm -hmm. however they do thrive in in some um colder lakes or springs and creeks and rivers but anyways going back to the subject smallmouth bass obviously the name says it has smallmouth and they i think it, they attack their bait more ferociously whereas as largemouth bass a lot of times they just attack by inhaling you know they open their mouth they create this void and they inhale the bait where smallmouth bass doesn't have that advantage it really has to like attack whatever yeah. it's going for and i think that that bite is very very more very different and very intense compared to a, some of the bites you might get on a large mouth bass yeah and one of my favorite places to fish for smallmouth is a river system but it's a deep river system. It's up to 50 feet in spots. It's a shipping channel uh, called the St. Clair River. It divides Ontario from Michigan. That's one of my favorite spots to fish. And I'm telling you, sometimes you would think you've got a muskie on the line. They hit so hard and they fight so hard to get back down to the bottom. It's shocking how hard sometimes they will, they'll fight to get back down to the bottom. And, you know, jumping out of the water, uh, you gotta be careful they don't spit the hook at you. So yeah that's always especially treble hooks <laughs> yeah what are the go-to techniques for fishing for smallmouth bass um where you live so my preferred method would be a ned rig uh, but i would say drop shot number one ned rig a tubes are really big here for fishing on for smallmouth on lake st Clair. i think some people are getting away from the tube a little bit so it's kind of a good idea to throw it because they're throwing drop shot more but i still use a tube especially in the fall and i get lots of good hits off of the tube but i would say ned rig that's how i catch i've caught all my biggest bass bass uh drop shotting really big and the tube would be the top three jerk bait i love jerk bait fishing um those would probably be the top four 
I know it's kind of like different because over there the season is shorter, but there is a difference in November to June. What is there any particular bait that works better in June and any particular bait that works better towards the end of November? So even right now with the water warming up, um, earlier in the summer I can get a better jerk bait bite than I can now. So right now I kind of just I pay attention to what they're doing if I see them in the water. I'll pay attention if they're just kind of like hanging out, moving slowly, kind of solitarily. I'll throw a drop shot in the morning because they'll be more aggressive. But by by mid morning, I'll throw a net rig and just kind of let it sit on the bottom, and I'll get more bites that way. So those are kind of my preferred methods. As for spring, you know they're still pretty aggressive in the spring. You can throw almost anything to get them, and you can throw a drop or a net rig all day. You can. You can swim it, you know, you can let it sit there, they'll, they'll bite it. Same with drop shot. I'm assuming with the, with the restrictions on when you can target it, by, the, by mid-June, spawning season is done where you, where you, in your area, right? Is that for correct? The, for the most part, yeah. We've, ha we've had years where we have such cold, cold springs that spawn is delayed a little bit. And by the time the season opens, they might just, some might still be finishing spawn. Um, so it just depends on our weather. Our weather is so crazy. You could have ice in the water till mid-May some years, um, just depending on, just depending on the winter. That's interesting. Um, as far as walleye goes, what is the big difference between fishing for walleye and fishing for smallmouth or largemouth bass? So in the springtime, there's a really big push through the river systems. And it's one of the biggest walleye runs probably in North America. So they will run up through the St. Clair River, the Detroit River, out into Lake Erie. So early on in the spring, we'll start vertical jigging in, in the river systems. Probably some, most of the time they start in March, depending on the temperature. And we'll just, we'll, so we'll start vertical jigging for walleye. So basically it's just a jig head with a trailer and you're fishing straight up and down and you want early in the spring it's kind of more of a slow you're just lightly bouncing it off the bottom and then later in the spring you kind of like move your lure up through the water column depending on where they're chasing the bait fish so as the current is pushing you down the river it's kind of i like it because it keeps i find it so you got to think through it you got to make sure your lure is straight up and down all the time completely vertical um, in order to get that bite. So that's kind of why I love walleye fishing. I love the challenge of it. I love figuring out where in the water column they're sitting and uh, vertical jigging, it just gives you something to think about the whole time versus just, you know, throwing a lure out there and sitting. That's cool. I, I, I think being that we don't have walleye, it's more like what we consider sand bass here, like the sand bass run in... Um, in uh, early spring or mid spring where they start going up the rivers and it's so easy to catch them um but it's kind of like a similar i guess in that way you know as far as not in the way that you fish for them but i, I think more smallmouth bass here it's more like spinner baits um yeah. inline spinner baits and uh jerk baits and i think yeah. those are the ones that work more so it's very different i don't think we do vertical chicken yeah. Um, but it's it's kind of like that aspect of it, like when we're not bass fishing, we're sand bass fishing. Yeah. Um, so be, and the same, they do the that up the creeks and up the rivers for spawning. So that's very interesting. Now, going back to s largemouth bass, you told us you know net rigs, um, tubes work for smallmouth bass. What does largemouth bass typically uh, bite on in Ontario? I would say exact same things that you guys are doing. Sankos, um, if I can run a jerk bait over a weed line, I love that. Frogs, topwater, uh, wacky rigs, basically the exact same things you guys are doing. Same strategies, um, punching, flipping. We do have certain lakes. A lot of our, the lakes where a lot of our kayak fishing tournaments are held are in an area not far outside of Toronto and you could some of those little lakes they have everything you would want to become a better largemouth angler they got lily pads they got uh, tree stumps they have the thick weeds they have everything that you need 
to learn how to be a better bass angler. Now, because I didn't grow up fishing, like this is a hobby I took up in adulthood. I'm 40 now, and I've only been targeting bass since 2018. When I see the guys up there fishing, you know, they've learned how to largemouth fish through all, every, every scenario. Whereas down here in the Great Lakes area, we don't, you know, you have to really search out those lily pads and those different scenarios. So up there, I think you can become a better, well-rounded largemouth mm -hmm. angler. A lot of those things I'm still learning how to do, how to become, you know, when I see the super thick, thick weeds, I, I still struggle. I think, oh no, what am I, you know, I really, I need to practice that more, but I shy away from it a little bit just because it's not something I really sat down and tried to get good at. What are some of your goals as far as kayak fishing goes and uh, specifically for bass fishing? What do you like to accomplish as far as being more, like I think you touched on it a little bit, being uh, more of an all-around angler or being more, winning more tournaments. And I, and I say this because there is a difference. For example, when I started kayak fishing on tournaments, which was last year, my goal wasn't to win it was more to gather information yeah. talk to after the tournament because yeah. i don't i'm not going to ask during the tournament hey what are you catching my lawn because i think that's kind of disrespectful yeah. but after the tournament you know i'll ask you know what what was working for you and i want to learn and what were you doing so my first season was more like i want to become better at this not yeah. necessarily win if i can get a win wonderful yeah. but my my victory kind of thing is like what did i learn that day what did i learn when it was pre-spawn yep. spawning post-spawn hot summer days fall bite winter bite that's that's my goal that was my goal yep. for you that you started picking up the sport what has been the goal for you and how does that transitioned yeah it's a great question every year i try to pick one new technique and get better at that technique and i can tell you i've seen myself become a better or a more well-rounded angler using different techniques in different situations. I don't go out into tournaments thinking that I'm going to win because I think I still have a long way to go. Uh, I would say average middle of the pack, sometimes a little better. Um, month longs, I try to take month long tournaments and get better at breaking down water. Uh, when I go to different tournaments, I looking, I try to get better at breaking down water, um, figuring out how that fish, how that lake fishes. And I can, every year that goes by, I see myself getting a little bit better. And I know I still have a long way to go, but I tell you, sometimes I look at my performances on different lakes and I think, wow, I can't believe how far that I've come. No. Yeah. So I try to pick one new technique every year. Like last year it was a jerk bait. I knew nothing about jerk bait fishing and now I, I can't put one down because it's so productive. Um, top water, I, I spent more time working on top water this year, uh, drop shotting for smallmouth because I wasn't super confident in it. And I've tried so many different, uh, different rods and drop shot hooks until I found what worked for me. Um, so every, every tournament, I just try to get it a little bit better. I don't, I think some people can judge those for wanting to, you know, going to all these tournaments without a ton of experience. But I can, I tell you, it's the best way to learn how, how yeah. to become a better angler. Hands down, when you go to a lake, you've never been there before. You have no choice but to figure it out. And the little bit of fishing I've done around other people, I don't really ask them questions. I just watch what they're doing. I, w mm -hmm. I watch and I'm like, wow, I see how that person is slowing down when they fish, how they're taking their time. And that's one thing I struggle with is being patient when I'm fishing, especially when the bite is tough. Um, so for me, it's just every year becoming a better angler. And I, I can see that happening um, already. Yeah, it's interesting when you think about that. Me coming from Puerto Rico and not doing any bass fishing over there and then moving here. And when I got hooked into bass fishing and kayak fishing, you know, I'm going against guys on a tournament um, that grew up, maybe not on a kayak, but on a boat of bank fishing. And I'm like, how am I supposed to, like, 
compete with somebody that has decades of knowledge because even a 20 year old has two decades of fishing yeah. for bass where i'm like i just picked up the sport and there's and there's no substitute for time on the water and i've said this before yes watching videos like the fluke master um um and other great um content creators that are more specific to learning techniques than they are to making a TV show. Um, I've learned a lot from it, but that's only going to take you so far, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, because whatever they're teaching, they're applying to what they grew up or what they've learned, but may not necessarily work in your areas or may not necessarily be your strength. So in my opinion is the the quickest way to get from point A, which is being a beginner, to point B, which is being an advanced kayak ang bass kayak angler, is go to tournaments. Even if you're not that type of guy that wants to compete and all that, if you just want to do it for yourself, just you want to enjoy your experience on the water more and be able to catch more fish just for yourself, even if, if you're not a competitor, consider going to a small club where you don't have to invest $250 for an entry <laughs> fee. Maybe it's twenty dollars or some of those um i know here in texas we have the like the working man's tournament which is like ten dollars but being getting involved rubbing shoulders breaking bread with some of the guys that do this you know constantly up your game just being on the water with them it's just you get that vibe you get the juices flowing as far as like getting more serious about catching fish and again everybody is different you know some people just you know they don't want the stress of competing. They just yeah. want to relax. relax and if that's what it is, then that's fine. But if you are interested in just, and for those out there, listen, if you are interested in getting in, into becoming a better angler, whether it's for you or competing, consider joining a local club, yeah. you know, and just ask questions. After the tournament, ask them. Most anglers will tell you. They may not tell you their, their preferred spot, but they'll share information with you and how they catch them and, you know, what worked for them and during that time of season. So it's a great opportunity to kind of like broaden your horizons as far as knowledge goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, hands down, time on the water. Like, I don't think people realize the amount of time. Like, I, you can see through my Instagram every year me getting better. And I don't think people have realized the amount of time I have put on the water to get where I am to catching some of these trophy smallmouth bass. I, like, when I first started, I could go days without catching a bass. And now I'm pulling in, like, 19 and a half, 20 and a half inch smallmouth all, all morning long. And on a good day. Um, the amount of time I have put in four or five, six days a week sometime when I'm not busy at work just to try to get better at what I'm doing. And, and yeah, like you said, every person you talk to, they're not going to, they're not going to tell you what spots necessarily they're fishing, but they might give you one little tidbit of information that you could use to piece together later on. So tournament fishing, meeting the anglers in your area is so important because there's so many talented guys out there and especially in Ontario, the guys have been so welcoming, so helpful. I don't think I would be where I wouldn't be where I am today without them and their support. So like you said, joining a local club, if it's something that you're thinking about wanting to do is really important. It is. And again, everybody joins um, the kayak fishing community for different reasons. But mm -hmm. again, if you're looking to and for those out there listening, if you're looking to, you know, get better at it, consider it. Now, you mentioned something about um, your Instagram account. And I wanted to ask you about that because I know uh, as far as social media goes, and I know for a lot of us that are, you know, love kayak fishing, kayak fishing, fishing in general can be expensive. Now, if you get a certain amount of followers, then you might be able to get, you know, some pro staff, some influence type deals where it kind of save you some money, maybe get some free stuff. I know that's been my case. And I noticed, I know for you, you've had, a, 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 you know, a great following and you put out great content. It is not easy for you. Some guys will say, well, yeah, it's, you know, if it's, you know, attractive young woman, yeah, of course, she's going to get a bunch of more followers than I, I am, a, you know, mid 40s over the way uh, over the hill guy and that's partially true but there is also the part of the dark side of it is you got you got you as a female angler 
um, get exposed to a lot of like, I don't know, like harassments that we guys don't get. Um, and it's a sad truth, you know. It is. How, do, how, do, how do you handle that and how does, how does that affect you? Because I know it's like at the end of the day, we love kayak fishing because we want to relax. Yeah. Um, and enjoy it. But then we add the element of social media, trying to go on our media, and now we have to deal with this, you know, elements of society that are not very desirable. How does that work for you? Yeah, I think a lot of it is how uh, you put yourself out there, too. And I think that I've done a really good job of showing how passionate I am about fishing. And I would say 95% of my followers are respectful. But you're always going to get that small percentage where you're who they're getting in your direct messages, your DMs, sliding in your DMs, as they would say, and making comments about your appearance or your legs, or you're going to get people with hate, um, whether it be like I've had people accuse me of having other people, male counterparts, scouting out spots and then I'm just going there and they're in the background as well on their boat and which is couldn't be further from the truth um I, I'm been of the one out there scouting my spots learning on my own so you do get a, you do get have to put up with the sexist comments you have to put up with people messaging you about your appearance and whatnot but I think when you truly show and I don't know how it is for a lot of the other female anglers when you truly show how passionate you are about the sport, especially in the kayak fishing community. I feel a lot of the men are really respectful of mm -hmm. your passion for the sport if you can show that through. Um, if I am getting negative comments, I don't feed into it. It doesn't bother me at my age. I'm 40 years old. I, I just don't care about. I don't care about that anymore. I just don't. I don't even respond to it because it's not worth my time. You know, that's a good point because I think, like you said, it's we when you love something, enjoy it and share it, then you get to deal with negativity. It kind of takes a little bit of the joy away from it. I know a lot of people says like, I don't want to deal with the with with uh, the internet, which can be it can be a dark place sometimes. Yeah, unfortunately, and I, can see, I can see already like as my followers have have grown, that it's starting mm. to get a little bit worse. Uh, just in yeah. the last few months. So I was thinking about that the other day. Like if I keep growing this account, am I going to run into more problems? And that's something I'm going to have to consider as that, you know, if my account progresses more. Because that's something I do not I'm want. Quite. Like I don't want negativity in my life. I don't like drama. I try to cut all those things out. So that'll just have to be something that I consider definitely and one of the things that i wanted to bring you on the show is because i i followed your account and i always noticed that it's you're very responsible and everybody should respect because your account is about fishing and your talent as a kayak angler and i have the utmost respect and i always want to bring female anglers um to my podcast to talk about the kayak fishing experience because first of all there are great women out there fishing that are doing this in a responsible way, that are doing it in a way that it's showcasing their abilities and not something else that is meant to just grab attention towards yeah. you, not to what you're doing. So I can, you know, I congratulate you on the way you're going about it. I know it's a very responsible way, and it's unfortunate that you have to deal with some people that can't, that just for whatever reason can't see past their ignorance and just focus on stuff that has nothing to do with what you're presenting on your Instagram yeah. or your social and, media. Yeah, and not realizing how hard that I've worked to just do something that I love so much. Um, how, go ahead. No, I'm done. No, I was gonna ask you, so how did you eventually got into kayak fishing? Because I know I know that in Ontario it may not be as big as it is down here in, for example, Texas or uh, southern states where you can fish all year long. So what got you into saying, you know what, I want to get into a little plastic boat and fish? You know, what, what got you into it? <laughs> so it's funny. So I used to fish out of a boat and it was kind of like I liked it, but it wasn't 
my boat and I wanted to be able to go out whenever I wanted, but I didn't want to have the hassle of trailering a boat. And probably in 2017 or 18, I was gifted an ice shanty for ice fishing. And it was that moment where I went from being someone who was dependent on someone else to take me fishing to me getting a single man shanty and traveling out there and learning how to find spots, learning how to tie on my own lures, learning how to unhook my own fish. And it took me that ice fishing season to realize I can do this. Like some days are harder than others. Like I, I would struggle to get the hook out of the fish's mouth at first. But I wanted that independence of being able to have the exercise and being able to fish at the same time and to be able to go whenever I wanted. So for me, the kayak just made sense. I did a, a ton of research. So it was that first year that I got that shanty and learning how to scout out my own spots, learning that independence. So the kayak just made sense for me because I wanted to get out on the water on my own and I wanted to have the exercise and just learn how to fish on my own. Nice. What kayak do you use right now? What's your, your favorite kayak? So I started out in a 2016 Hobie Outback. I was lucky to find one used. And right now I, so after that, I upgraded to the 2019 Outback. And then in 2020, I got a Pro Angler 12. And I'm still in a Pro Angler 12. Nice. How's that experience in the Pro Angler? Do you like it? Hands down, like I still have an Outback, but hands down, I can't imagine not having that extra space of the Pro Angler. Yeah. So much easier to stand up in. And the 360 drive, especially in that wind for uh, and in the river systems, it is hands down, I can't imagine not having Oh, so you got the 360? Yeah, I got the 360. How do you like it? I, I love it. Like being able to push your nose back into the wind onto a spot. I, I, when I take out my Outback now, I still love it, but you miss not having the 360 to turn your nose no, it, back to where you want it is i mean i love it that's that's what i have right now i have the pa 14 360 but it's it's i know i know it gets thrown around a lot but i really believe this is one of the few times it's kind of warranted the game changer yeah. status because yeah. it really is it really changes the way to me it changes the way i fish as far as being able to to get into places that i would probably wouldn't even waste my time on an outback just because it's not it's it's a hassle especially if you don't have a motor if you have a trolling motor that's different now in your case do you have a trolling motor it's just pedal i don't have a motor everyone's starting to get motors i still say i'm not going to have one but i wouldn't be surprised if next year that i do but i would like you, to go i'd like to go for as long as i can without one i completely agree with you you see to me it's like to me it stops being a kayak once you get a motor and for those out there listening please don't unfollow me please don't <laughs> stop listening to me i'm not being a purist i'm not hating on the motors no. you know i i don't have a problem with the motors just for me personally i feel yeah. like you know once you take that manpower out um it kind of changes the game you know in that aspect it, to me it's no longer kayak now i'm not hating on it i don't have a problem yeah. with um participating i was just in a tournament and most of the guys have motors mm -hmm. so i don't have a problem with it i mean i'm not i'm not here campaigning to ban motors or anything like that but at the same time i leave that i leave myself the right to change my mind at some point so i wouldn't be surprised if i eventually go to a motor and if i do it'll probably yeah. be a, a spot lock i don't see the benefits of of really using like a torpedo nothing against torpedo but if i the big advantage is the spot lock. Other than yeah. that, I'm just moving from point A to point B faster. Yeah. And I guess that's cool. But, I mean, to have that spot lock, I get it. That is a big advantage, especially on open waters. Yeah, and I, I fished one tournament in early August. It was, it was so tough. It was the Ontario Kayak Bassmaster National Championship. And it was tough, tough fishing. And I would say that was the only tournament that I could say where I could have used a motor to my advantage to move to a different spot that was further away to make it easier um, because it was so hot 
it, it's the only tournament I could say that it had an advantage because in the most part I don't think a, a, a motor necessarily gives you an advantage it comes down to skill and being able to yeah. and being able to pick apart an area better than someone else I, I don't think it necessarily gives you an advantage in all tournaments no it doesn't I mean as far as the way I see it let's say like a spot lock the the main the the biggest advantage of it is if you are in a place where a, a shallow anchor like a stake pole is not going to work because mm -hmm. you're in deeper waters and there's wind there's current and you have a spot lock yes that is an advantage now you can also anchor in with a kayak it's not the same because there's a lot more of trying to position yourself yep. or you know it's gonna where you can you know get to that fish so where a spot like you just press the button that's it you're there having said that if you're not good at that at that particular technique that you're gonna be that you're gonna need for fishing that offshore point then spot lock's not gonna do you any good you're just fishing at, at you're just fishing at waters that you're not prepared to fish because you don't you're not you don't have that skill on your arsenal that's the way i see it 100 percent. and our main kayak trail here in ontario still doesn't allow motors in the tournament trail and if they do i bet i know they probably will one day they'll probably will one day but i don't think just because you have a motor it's just like a fish finder you can have the best fish finder doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna win so i you know i you have to be a well-rounded angler still so speaking of fish finder what fish finder do you rock and uh how is that <laughs> so how does that play into your game this year, I just upgraded to the really? Lawrence uh, Elite FS9. Uh, it was a birthday present for, to myself. So I just upgraded to that, and I can tell you it has, in fact, improved, improved my fishing game. The side scan on that thing is so clear. It is like uh, before I was running just a hook 2.5. And with that bigger screen and the detail that I can see, the, the posts in the water, you know, the weed lines is just phenomenal. And it really has helped me in the few tournaments I've done this year uh, in the tournament trail. Like being able to see those weed lines, being able to see that log on the bottom of the water. Like it's, upgrading has been phenomenal. Awesome. Yeah, it is. The use of technology can be once you apply it to your knowledge, it can't substitute your knowledge. Yeah, it should amplify your knowledge. Yeah, that's the way I sure. see it. For sure, and it does. You can't. It does not. Gonna. It's not gonna make you a better angler. That's a hundred percent. It's just going to complement the skills that you have learned and are learning. Definitely. So, what are your goals now? Um, now that you're in like year three of your kayak fishing experience what are your goals long term and short term as a com competitor that's a great question or, because yeah. i love the tournament fishing i there's part of me that loves it there's the other part of me that hates being away from home and hates taking my time away from being a multi-species angler but i still plan on competing like i want to be more consistent in my in-person tournaments. I want to start consistently becoming, coming in the top 10. And I haven't been to as, as many tournaments this year just because work interferes with that a lot. Uh, personal life has interfered with that a lot. Um, I want to become a more consistent angler. I don't see myself becoming a consistent winner in the next two years, but I can see myself getting there in the next five to seven. Mm -hmm. I could see myself being in that top if I keep working as hard as I am now and I don't get distracted, I don't see why that couldn't be a possibility. Um, if I ever decide to take a step away from the tournament fishing, I think it would be more of um, getting people interested in kayak fishing and fishing tournaments and learning new skills. Um, I think I am a fairly approachable person in my area where people who might feel uncomfortable men and women talking to someone else about how to do something feel more comfortable talking to me and maybe it's just because some men don't want to approach other men to ask them how to ask questions about their Lawrence units you know things like that um whereas they feel comfortable talking to me 
So I feel like I have the ability to pass on knowledge and help people who are just getting started. So maybe that might be a direction that I take in the future as well. Becoming an ambassador to the kayak fishing community, that's, yeah. that's great. Because yeah. I know tournament, not that it's surf serving, but at the same time, it's kind of like, to me, it's like a measuring stick. You know, yeah. how good am I compared to, you know, the the yeah. Brian Howells, Russ Snyder's, Christine Fisher's uh, of the kayak fishing world. Um, but it's more like just for me, you know, kind of self-serving, not in a bad way, yeah. but just but when you're in the ambassador, it's more about the community and not just yourself, you know, not yeah. just getting exposure, but more about lifting the community up. And that's very noble, I think. Yeah, and I think there's a lot more people are starting to do meetups in the area yeah. versus tournaments and people feel more comfortable in that environment. I think a lot of people shy away from the tournament scene because they're worried about failing instead of looking at the bigger picture of you're going to a tournament, not just to win, you're going to meet other people. And for me, that's what tournament fishing has always been. It's to be better than I was the last time and as well as meeting new people and I have met so many new people I'm so grateful for the community in our area people have embraced me um, and you know being a girl traveling can be a little bit difficult um, you know when it comes to rooming with other people I'm lucky where I have found people that to room with and share cottages with because you know I've met their wives they know that I'm there for the fishing and they know that I'm not a threat and I'm just so lucky to have a community that doesn't treat me like I'm just a girl and I'm just, an, I'm just another anger. So I'm really fortunate to have that. That's very good. And that's awesome that the community is growing, I think, in an organic way that kind of lifts everybody up and lifts the kayak fishing community. It's still young compared to like the big bass yeah. boat world, but I think we have that unique opportunity to kind of like make it our own and make sure it grows before all the corporate, it gets yeah. big enough where corporates start coming in and then that changes the game inevitably. Um, that's just the way it, it is. But for now we have that ability to kind of like shape it into what we we want um, yeah. and get what we want out of it. Okay. What is what is your favorite setups as far as rods and reels for your favorite techniques? What do you like to, to use and uh, what's some of your favorite brands as far as rod reels and baits? So I would say uh, the top brand I'm using right now is St. Croix. Uh, a lot of my bait casting casting rods are Mojo Bass rods that I've had for a while now. Uh, walleye rods, um, St. Croix as well. I do have a few Fenwicks that I like a lot that are all-purpose rods um, and I've started using a Canadian company rod called um, their tactical fishing rods and they're specific to different to walleye as well as bass and I've started using their drop shot rod and I'm telling you I went through two other drop shot rods before this one because I was like I'm no good at drop shotting but I think it was just the equipment that I was using so I started using um, tactical fishing drop shot rod and that has helped me a lot. So I would say those are the top three companies that that I'm using. I have Luz as well, a couple. So I'm pretty well rounded in what rods that I use. But I would say Saint Croix, um, tactical fishing gear, a couple Fenwicks, and Luz are my main setups. So let me ask you again: What is your favorite um, reels to use? Favorite oh, brands? Favorite yep. rule, uh, reels. Uh, Daiwa for sure when it yeah. comes to casting reels like I'm telling you <laughs> like using my first buying my first Daiwa was the best thing that I ever did best thing I ever did and Shimano I would say for uh, my spinning reels I'm still really happy with all my Shimano reels yeah. when it comes to spinning yeah I think that's right now those are the two top brands my favorite I started out with Lou's reels gave up on them yeah uh, i'm not gonna go into that i'm not here to bash any companies but um then i got into shimano i think my entry to shimano was their um shimano slx which to yeah, me is me the it kind of like 
I wouldn't say entry level because it's still ninety nine dollars. It's not like you know, it's not mm. like the Abu um, Max, which is like some like fifty dollars, or Loose Silver, which is like fifty dollars. So it's not that entry level. But as far as um, reels under a hundred dollars, the Shimano SLX is to me hands down the best. Yeah, I agree. Out I, there. That was my yeah. first. That, those were my first reels that I learned on for casting. Uh, for and big I, casters. Yeah, and I think that when once you get into that mid level, the Corrados um, are amazing. Once you get into the really premium reels, I think Daiwa has stepped up the game. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you're talking about high end reels, expensive reels, Daiwa, I've I've gravitate, gravitated to Daiwa a lot. I I used to love, and I still do, but um, Abu Garcia. But I've now moved on to more like. Daiwa and Shimano and I think right now those are the top two brands as far as quality goes yeah in my opinion again everybody has their own opinion not anything on any other company but my experience Daiwa and Shimano are probably the best two I agree yeah like when I first started I had never used a casting reel or casting like rod reel before and I was actually told by some people that oh don't worry it'll be too hard just stick with spinning it'll be too hard for you and my I dad, hate with people my, like that. My dad looked at me one day and he said, "Who told you that?" He's like, "It is so easy. Do not listen to them. Go out and buy one." And I did, and I and after using one, I was like, "This is amazing." I don't know why I listened yeah. to anyone who would tell me that. It's it has its place definitely, and yeah. I think uh, there is instances where spinning reel is gonna work better, but for the most part, casting reels are. Once you master it, and it's not easy, and you always, I don't care how long you've been fishing, you all, you're you going to get a backlash, a bird's nest somewhere, somehow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Still, I don't care how experienced you are. It's just yeah. going to happen. If you're not getting it, you're not using it properly. Yeah. <laughs> That's to be, you know, you're not putting the bait in the right place if you're not getting a backlash every now and then. Yeah, that's true. But definitely. What about lures? What are some of your favorite lure companies out there? Do you like prefer soft plastic, hard baits? You mentioned jerk baits. What's your favorite jerk bait company? If you have one. So I would say Jackal and Mega Bass. Jackal's very good. Yes. I the fact that I said that out loud, I normally don't tell anyone that. <laughs> and oh. then I have someone that custom paints some jerk baits, uh, JVM Custom Lures. He's Canadian, and he custom. Uh, paint some jerk baits for me as well, so I would say those are my top three. I mean, those I, are the Mega Bass. Yeah. That's an ob- obvious one. Mega Bass is the only company I don't switch out the treble hooks. Honestly, yes. yeah, I think their treble hooks are far better than most out there. Yes. I, any other ones, I'll probably switch out the hooks, but Mega Bass, I don't even have to worry about it, and they're mm-hmm. expensive. They're expensive. Yeah, I, I I cry a little every time I break off on a jerk bait. Yeah, and soft plastics. <laughs> I mean, Z Man. I use Z Man a lot. Yeah. Uh, Angler's Choice is a Canadian company, so you guys probably never heard of them. But Angler's Choice, Walleye Bass, um, great. I love, I love their lures. Um, another one, Kai Tech. I use Kai Tech a lot. Oh, Kai Techs are very good. Yeah, yeah, and they have some good top water, like soft plastic top water baits as well. Um, they've got those soft frogs that are really good. Someone told me about those and I appreciate that. So I tried those last year and they worked really good. You mentioned Jackal before. Jackal has some great, best, to me, my opinion, the best frogs are made oh, by Jackal. Yeah, they're, is it the Kiara frog? Kiara, yeah, frogs. Yes, those are awesome. Those are I'm awesome. still not great at frog fishing. I've been practicing, practicing. That's one skill I want to get better at at the frog fishing. But I imagine that's very short window over there in in Ontario, right? There's a lot of guys throwing a frog right now who live further up east, and um, it's not something we do as often down here uh, in the Great Lakes area. But it still can be productive for a lot of the year. What does it? Do you frog fish in November? No, I wouldn't say. I would say yeah. uh, November is more finesse fishing time. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I figure because I'm I'm thinking you know it's gotta be, especially since you can't fish till June, that frog bite has a very it must be a very small window of, of mm-hmm. a couple of months to mm-hmm. fish uh, use them over there in in Ontario. Yeah. 
Any plans of coming down south to board and fish some tournaments? Big names like Bass, Hobie, BOS, or KBF? So our border is still basically closed because of COVID. Oh, yeah. We're keeping each other out. But uh, right before that, I was supposed to go to Kentucky. Before the border closed, really? I was supposed to go to Kentucky Lake to fish my first Hobie BOS. And then COVID happened. And But I would say Lake Fork is on my bucket list for sure. There you go. Yes. You got to come. Yes. I... You know, you watch all the footage, and I really, really want to try fishing there. It just looks like an amazing place to fish. It is. I just got second place on Lake Fork, but it's summer, um, which is, I don't know how you're going to like it, Jamie, <laughs> but it is hot and humid. Yeah. There's, like, yeah. mosquitoes and all kinds of insects all over you. It was miserable this weekend, as far as weather goes, and the bite gets really tough. Then you have the great time in spring, you know, pre-spawn and spawning. But then you have all these crappy fishing guides who are, because, you know, it kind of coincides with um, crappy spawning. And you have all these tournaments targeting, you know, uh, spawning bass. So it gets so overcrowded mm -hmm. that it's, that's the only thing. It gets very touristy kind of thing. Yeah, I was hoping for February, March, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely have to come down. Yeah. Love to have you here in Texas and uh, kind of show you around some of the great lakes yeah. that we have. I have here. fished in Tennessee before. I fished Center Hill Lake one year in 2019, and that nice. was that was foreign to me. Like that's like fishing on Mars compared to fishing here. Like fishing a reservoir, <laughs> <laughs> fishing a reservoir is so different than fishing here. So oh, so you have more like natural lakes over there than you fish in Ontario. Yes. Yeah, nice. all natural lakes. It's not. Yeah, yeah. It's a, we don't have the man-made lakes like you guys do. Yeah, we here in Texas, I think there's only one natural lake, and that's Cottle Lake, and that's more like border between Texas and Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I've never fished a man-made lake. It's all reservoir, so I don't even know how we're doing a man-made lake. So, well, the we'll tournament see. scene's growing up here. Like now, we're getting up to 100 anglers, and some of them really. Are, so there's money to oh. be won. If, like when the border opens, you guys, there's money to be won up here in the summertime. So come up and fish the Ontario Kayak Bass Trail. It, it's a long drive. Can you lend me a kayak and some gear? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a spare kayak? <laughs> nice. I'll be I'll be rocking the Outback. I'm assuming. Oh no! See, I would let you use the pro. I would let you use the pro. <laughs> I doubt that. You're just saying that. <laughs> but Jamie, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, I mean, it's like I said. I'm a huge fan of your social media content. I look forward to you know what you have planned uh not just for yourself as a competitor but also if you do go the route of the ambassador for the kayak fishing community please count on our support here in paddle and fin i think you're doing a great job of showcasing your skills and lifting the kayak fishing community up in ontario canada i know that's growing over there it's booming like you said 100 and, and plus anglers on the tournament that is amazing we want to yeah. see those numbers everywhere so, but before I let you go, I want to give you a chance to thank anybody we want to thank, any sponsors if you have them, any family members, anybody that makes your kayak fishing experience better. Yes, so uh, thank you so much, Hobie Fishing, uh, Folk Marine. I am on the Hobie Fishing team through Folk Marine. I'm very grateful for their support. Uh, Tightline Anchor, um, they support me as well. Uh, tactical fishing gear they support me as well so thank you but thank you to all the kayak anglers who encouraged me in ontario you guys know who you are thank you so much for encouraging me making me feel welcome um yeah so thanks guys and if you want to find me on social media uh, you can find me on instagram under northern kayak angler there you go northern kayak angler follow her on instagram facebook as well just instagram for now yep uh facebook as well yeah as well so jamie thank you so much for joining us for those out there listening you've made it this far appreciate you joining us for today's episode check out my sponsor douglas outdoors go to douglasoutdoors.com check out the full line of x matrix lls rods and some great fly fishing rod award-winning fly fishing rods if you're going to be out on the water please be safe wear your pfds take the necessary precautions to get back home to your loved ones have a great day everyone peace